Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you are watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Twice per month I host this show about pediatric health topics where we take and answer your questions live. Today we are talking about enhancing upper limb function in brain and spinal cord injured patients through surgery to make their hands function again. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Peter Ree, a talented orthopedic hand surgeon at Mayo Clinic with expertise in upper extremity reconstruction in patients with peripheral nerve damage. Dr. Ree trained at Mayo Clinic and then served as a hand surgeon in the U.S. Air Force. Dr. Ree is very active in the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, including serving as the chair of the Military Re Relations Committee. He also participates in the American Association for Hand Surgery, and he is the co-chair of Mayo Clinic Veterans Merg. Dr. Ree is also associate professor of orthopedics at Mayo Clinic. It's going to be a great discussion today, so please send in your questions under the Facebook Live video feed, and we'll try our best to review and get to them during our live video broadcast. Also, thank you everyone who stayed with us um, for the delay, and we're excited to get our show started now. So, Dr. Reed, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's going to be a great discussion. Yes. So you, um, you have an interest in this topic that was kind of spurred by some, some personal experience. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I initially didn't think I would take care of this patient population, mm -hmm. but um, my father had a stroke uh, many years ago, and I just saw firsthand as a, as a family member the struggles he went mm -hmm. through. And then after that, um, my oldest nephew ended up getting something called transverse myelitis. Um, and with that, he became uh, tetraplegic. And I saw his struggles too. And it really made me think about all the things that we could do mm -hmm. um, in hand surgery to help restore some independence. And this is a picture of him right here. Yes. Okay, so this was obviously prior to yes. the transverse this myelitis. Yes, this is Brandon when he was a um, senior in high school. Um, and he was 23. And woke up one morning and um, couldn't move anything below his neck. Um, he had a pretty remarkable recovery. He was in a wheelchair. Um, you can see on the left, that was when he was initially in the hospital and then afterwards when he was in an uh, inpatient rehab facility, um, did uh, very well with that, but still you can see his hands that he wasn't really able to move them because of his cervical level spinal cord injury. Okay. You also served in the military, and I imagine that this had a large influence also on, on your interests. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. The, um, in the military, uh, there was a lot of uh, blast injuries, mm -hmm. and with that, you get a lot of traumatic brain injuries. And so that was the bulk of the patients that I mm -hmm. took care of with these upper motor neuron injuries, which we'll get into. Um, and so I never really thinking that I would take care of those patients. Mm -hmm. it, just, it was just the need of... The patients there in the military and it was a great experience for me. Thank you for your service um, for our country and, and the time that you spent in Afghanistan as well. Thank you. It was yeah. my pleasure. So you just mentioned upper motor neuron injuries. Yes. Um, let's talk about what these are and help us understand what this might look like in a patient. Uh, great question. So really there's two there's two nerves in the, mm -hmm. in the body. There's mm -hmm. nerves that originate in the brain and come down the spinal cord mm -hmm. and then another set of nerves that go out to the to the limbs. Mm -hmm. The ones from the brain are called upper motor neurons, and then there's a connection in your spinal cord that then sends nerves out to the hand. Those are lower motor neuron injuries. Um, so if those are injured in the peripheral nerve, we call them, um, it's a whole different set of circumstances and treatment options versus an injury in the spinal cord of the brain. Okay, so what would um, the symptoms of a patient who's experienced upper motor neuron syndrome look like? So typically, if your upper motor neuron is injured, mm -hmm. um, you actually get an unmasking of these reflexes that you actually see in kids, mm -hmm. these primitive right. reflexes. And it's, it's that pathology that causes spasticity, which is probably the biggest thing we see in brain injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the spinal cord, it's a little different because there's an element of an upper motor neuron injury and mm -hmm. also these lower motor neuron injuries. So mm -hmm. you get actually two injuries with a spinal cord injury. Okay. And then with a spinal cord injury, patients mm -hmm. then will have flaccidity, so their, their limbs won't move. Okay. So what would be some things that would cause an upper motor neuron injury? So typically a stroke okay. or what we call a cerebrovascular accident, traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. uh, anoxic brain injuries, um, even um, uh, injuries to the brain in birth, such mm -hmm. as cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. uh, but also in the spinal cord, those since they're upper motor neurons there, that can cause it too. Okay. So what about um, the difference that you're going to see in some of the spinal cord injured patients? Um, are, we have some slides to kind of help illustrate this. Do you want to take us through those? Sure. Okay. 
So as you can see here in the in the top of the that that's a brain if you have never seen one in a in a figure before. <laughs> um, on the top, that's where the nerves come down, and it goes down to a, a cross section of the uh, spinal cord, and then the nerves that the green nerve that goes to what looks like looks like a looks like a smiley face actually. Um, that's actually supposed to be muscle. So nerves, lower motor neuron nerves that go out into the hand or the limbs, they either go to muscle or to an organ that provides sensation. And then we have another diagram here too. Yeah, and so this just kind of shows the brain, part of the brain, um, and an injury anywhere in the brain can cause upper motor neuron injury, but then in the spinal cord, uh, which you can kind of see in the neck area, uh, that would affect upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. I think there's one more slide. Yeah, and this is just an illustration of now what we call the peripheral nerves or the brachial plexus in the upper extremity. And these are the nerves that people can injure if they cut their arm, cut their forearm, um, or have bad injuries uh, like in motor vehicle accidents. So these are more the lower motor neuron injuries. So let's move on then to talking about so patients who've suffered um, brain injuries, some yes. of these upper motor neuron symptoms. What are the available options for management of the symptoms and what are some of the symptoms that you're gonna see in these patients, especially in their hands um, specifically? So because the upper motor neurons get injured and it's, it's spasticity is probably mm -hmm. the biggest problem, um, it's an unbalance of muscles. Some are stronger than others. Uh, and so typically we see patients with a shoulder that's tucked into their body, their arm gets rotated in, their, fore, their elbow gets flexed, mm -hmm. forearm gets bent or what we call pronated, wrist gets really flexed down like that. And that makes it very hard for them to do any function. If there is any function, the muscles are too tight. Um, also, it's hard for patients to have care, hygiene by their caretakers. So typically the surgeries are involved in trying to release that spasticity mm -hmm. and try to restore balance to these muscles and hopefully get their arm, if they're functional, some more function. But if, if their arms don't move, um, at least to get them in a better position so family members can better take care of them. Okay. What about, is there a non-operative management that you can do to help in some of these situations? Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that okay. because um, I tell my patients my job as a hand surgeon is mm -hmm. not to operate. Okay. And so surgery really should be a last resort. Mm -hmm. um, things like physical therapy, splinting, and uh, injections around the nerve or the muscle. Mm -hmm. So that's a chemical way of doing a, a surgery where we cut the nerve, um, but we just do like Botox, mm -hmm. which people know more for plastic surgery type of applications. Mm -hmm. But a Botox injection will eliminate the function of the muscle for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to relax that spasticity so that now the arm and their shoulder can move into a better position. Okay. Um, we um, have some nice slides kind of illustrating some of the classical uh, surgical um, interventions that you can do in patients that have brain injures, injuries. Yes. Do you want to take us through some of those? Sure. Okay. So again, if a patient has an injury to these nerves up in the brain, um, and we'll go to the next slide, uh, then you have a sp some spasticity. And this is a, a, a difference, which is more in the spinal cord. Uh, if we can go to the next slide... So this is a patient who had a brain injury. This is um, when I was in the military. And you can see that hand, it, it, it functions a little bit, but because of the imbalance of the muscles in, this, in the hand, it's in a, um, I guess, an awkward position. On the top picture, on the bottom side, that's the thumb. And the thumb really needs to be able to come out of the palm so you can grip and pinch objects. Mm -hmm. And you hear the spastic muscles are just not able to uh, let the hand do its function. So if you go to the next slide... Uh, this is just to show that the bones are all perfectly fine. It's a muscle problem. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And in part of surgery, we use a lot of different tools. But in this situation, we use what we call a, a fusion or an orthodesis to get the thumb in a better position, lock up some of the joints so that whatever joints are remaining, we can allow those, those muscles to work a little bit better. So maybe the next slide you can see. Or maybe it's the next video. So this is after the surgery, you can see the thumb is in a better position to now grasp uh, and now also to pinch too, which, which is huge. This could be the difference of a patient having someone take care of them so they can feed or dress themselves. And now with these minimal surgeries to release the spasticity, um, they can actually do these things on their own. Are all patients going to be, um, would doing surgical interventions be an option for them? Or how do you determine whether this would be something that you can proceed with to... I think Increased function. for brain injured patients, mm -hmm. they first have to um, 
be safe enough to undergo surgery, but then also they need to have enough cognition intact to um, actually utilize their new function. Mm -hmm. um, I think anyone's a candidate for surgery that has maximized the non-surgical options. Mm -hmm. um, and in those patients, um, these surgeries can give them quite a bit of independence. Absolutely. Um, what about the, well, just kind of going back to that video, the, the function that you were able to restore um, to that individual was remarkable. How did that go on to affect his life and be able to participate in, in the things that he things that he may not have been able to do before. Yeah, so previously he was he was right-handed and I was his right hand and so for the longest time mm -hmm. it was just um, and I don't mean it very crudely actually it's 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 actually a benefit if your arm can function as a paperweight mm -hmm. we say or a helper hand but right. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so he had to readjust to learn to use his non-dominant left hand mm -hmm. and after this it's, it takes a little bit of adjustment but then after a couple of months I think patients really you know, go with uh, their new function and they're very pleased with it. Okay. Is there a lot of rehab that's involved at post surgery? There's quite a bit of okay. rehab uh, just because when you move tendons around, mm -hmm. um, you're training your, you have to retrain your brain to do one function that's mm -hmm. used to be a different function. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little bit of training, but it's remarkable. The human brain can very quickly adapt to it. Okay. Let's review some of um, the options for treatment for patients who have not had spinal cord injuries, um, maybe both the non-surgical and the surgical options. Yes. So like I mentioned before, with the spinal cord injury, mm -hmm. um, since it involves upper motor neuron injuries, there's some spasticity there. But primarily what we see are patients that cannot use their, their arms. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on what level the injury is, because as you move down a level, you start getting more function from the shoulder down to the hand. Mm -hmm. um, the non-surgical options are splinting, making sure the joints all stay nice and loose. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, you can do surgery at any time. Okay. Um, and then beyond that, the surgical options are based on what muscles are available. Mm -hmm. If there's any muscles that are redundant, so other muscles can do that same job, we can use that muscle as a donor muscle and now do a job that they pre previously couldn't do because mm -hmm. those muscles were injured. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I think we have um, a slide about this and then also the, a video, which is remarkable to see. So this just shows that if uh, multiple studies have, have shown this, that if you ask a patient that has tetraplegia or quadriplegia, um, what function do you think would give you the highest or best improvement in your activities of daily living? And across the board, uh, arm and hand function um, is what most patients want. And even after surgery, they say that's was the most beneficial for them. Um, maybe in the next picture. Maybe. So this this is a patient who had an injury to his spinal cord. Actually, this is 45 years afterwards when I met him. Wow. And you can see that was his previously dominant hand. Um, after we did our surgery, now you can see that the hand can move. And now he can actually grab uh, a cup, put things into his palm, and, and use a pen. Um, these are things that for 45 years he had to abandon, and this arm was essentially useless. And now, just three months afterwards, he's trying to learn how to reuse all these new tendons. But previously, an arm, that a hand that couldn't grasp or pinch, mm -hmm. um, now he could do all that. For a spinal cord injury patient, that, that's a lot, because a lot of patients have... Um, they have to self-catheterize themselves, mm -hmm. which they can't. Mm -hmm. So they have caretakers doing that. If you can just give them this function, mm -hmm. they can do all that on their own, groom themselves, feed themselves. It's great for their independence and, mm -hmm. and just their self-worth. And Absolutely. So one of the, the videos, um, clips in there, it looked like it was intraoperative. Can yes. you tell us how um, and why you were doing some checking of his range of motion while you were um, while, during surgery? Yeah, thanks for noticing yeah. that. Um, it's actually something that... Uh, it's been, in hand surgery, it's, it's a concept of wide awake hand surgery, okay. and I really had to utilize that in the military, um, and something that we use in that patient because um, I wanted him to be happy with uh, the final outcome, mm -hmm. and so we numbed him up, so he, was, he felt no pain, but he was mm -hmm. completely awake, and once I felt like we were at a right spot, we put the drapes down, and he could just give me immediate feedback and say, that's, that's exactly, that's great, and it's very rewarding because when that patient, at least, when I saw his face and, and the yeah. smile, when he can actually use his hand, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's something else. Watching that video and reading that story about that patient on sharing.mayoclinic.org actually brought tears to my eyes. After 45 years, he's able to, like you mentioned, function independently, do things he wasn't able to do before. So. Yeah, it it um, especially with that patient, we're, we're good friends now, me and, and his whole family, and uh, uh, it's um, 
Yeah, it's it's remarkable. It, it really is. It really is. It's changing people's lives, absolutely. So we have a you mentioned it earlier on um but we have a great audience question that talks about, is there really a time limit for when you can do these interventions on patients who've had spinal cord in- injuries? <clears throat> there is, there's not a time limit as far as we know. Okay. Um, the earlier the better, uh, just because patients that have this in- devastating injury, they wanna move on with their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, if they've recovered for let's say two years, mm-hmm. and then they've reached the point that they feel like they're stable, and then to say we're gonna do surgery and lock your hand up for a couple of weeks mm-hmm. while you recover, that's kind of hard for them to go back. That's probably the biggest thing in, in waiting too long. But otherwise, as long as the joints move mm-hmm. um, and there's muscles available to use, um, it, it, like that gentleman, that's 45 years later mm-hmm. that you can do that. What about in pediatric patients? Is there going to be a difference in treating patients um, who have upper motor neuron syndrome um, symptoms um, in a child versus in an adult? The, the, the techniques are the same, and, and the philosophy really is the same. I think I would say that kids are remarkable, as you know. Mm-hmm. They have a way of recovering much easier than, than adults. Like when, when I get sick for my kids, I'm, <laughs> I'm out for days, and, yes. and they're just, it's like 10 yeah. minutes. Right. Um, so I would say that on the, on the positive side, mm-hmm. kids can recover remarkably, mm-hmm. and their brain is so plastic, we call right. it. They can reintegrate, relearn things so quickly that they will see the most benefit of mm-hmm. it. Uh, on the negative side with kids, if they've had, especially in cerebral palsy, they've mm-hmm. had these deformities and these um, injuries for so long, mm-hmm. I tend to see that their contractures are far worse because they had it for so long, mm-hmm. even despite parents' best intention of trying to, with therapists, trying to make things better. Mm-hmm. So it's really just, um, it, it's it's a difference in, I think, how complex the surgery is because mm-hmm. structures are so much smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to modify certain techniques, but uh, even in kids, there's mm-hmm. a remarkable um, uh, ability that we can give them with surgery. Okay. Are there things that therapists or parents or other caregivers can do after uh, a brain injury or a spinal cord injury to, to really help um, their patients with rehab and splinting and improving that range of motion? Uh, splinting, I think, is, is key. Okay. Um, next, therapy, whether it's with a therapist or a family member helping them, mm-hmm. I think that's very important, too. And and God bless my mother. She With my father, he she... Um, know massages his hand all the time and so I think that's very helpful mm-hmm. beyond that I think just getting plugged in with a, a physiatrist or a physical medicine rehab doctor who can go through uh, the other options such as injections medications for spasticity mm-hmm. I think just getting plugged in early with a specialist which most most patients are mm-hmm. and just being aware of what's out there Okay. We have a great audience question. It says, is there a therapy for improving upper limb function in spinal cord injury? And is there a time uh, post limit or a time limit post injury? I think we've kind of answered this, but is there anything else you would add to that? I would say starting things earlier. Okay. If, if immediately after an injury, when the joints are, are not moving, but they're mm-hmm. very, they're very flexible, mm-hmm. it's probably the best time to start with splinting. If you start a year down the road and they're already contracted, um, it's hard for splints to overcome that. They, they can to a certain degree, um, but starting earlier I think is better. Mm-hmm. But for brain injuries or spinal cord injuries, it's the mainstay as therapy, mm-hmm. making sure the joints all stay nice and limber. Okay, do you see any barriers to patients being able to have a hand surgery evaluation? Um, it, are people aware of this? Or Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. So in the United States, about 300,000 300, patients get a spinal cord injury. Wow. And I'd say about 60,000 get a cervical level spinal cord injury. Mm-hmm. Um, only about 10% of patients that are candidates for surgery actually get it. And there's been multiple studies to, sh- to yeah. ask why is this. Mm-hmm. And it's mainly because patients don't know that it's an option. Okay. Um, first that, and then secondly, I guess I think if it was my family member, I wouldn't want to go to someone that just dabbles in it once in a while. Mm-hmm. So you want to go to a center that actually does it frequently mm-hmm. with a big team. And there's not very many places in the United States that do that. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the biggest barrier, patients not knowing about it, mm-hmm. even physicians not knowing about it. Absolutely. Even as a hand surgeon, a, you know, five mm-hmm. years ago, I didn't know about it. Right. Until I actually had to witness it and mm-hmm. deal with patients firsthand. And that's what we're trying to do today is really promote the awareness so the audience out there can can know that this is an option. Yes. Um, and you mentioned going to a center that has a lot of experience in this, and that's really what Mayo Clinic does have. Why don't yes. you tell us a little bit about the program here? Well, we, we have uh, phenomenal people across the board. For instance, when uh, my nephew Brandon uh, was here, um, I, just to illustrate his, his, his visit here, mm-hmm. 
I feel like if as a hand surgeon, we just take care of his hand, we do him a disservice. And so mm-hmm. there are so many things that go on with these patients. Um, and so when he came, he saw a psychologist, saw a physiatrist, saw a urologist for his neurogenic bladder, saw a hand surgeon, a hand therapist. And so here we, we want to treat the whole patient mm-hmm. and not just a single thing. And um, the lucky thing about us, us working here is that none of us feel like we're better than anyone else. And mm-hmm. so it's, we feel like combining heads, mm-hmm. different specialties, multidisciplinary is much better right. for the patient. Right. And so right. I think that's, that's, I'm very proud of our team here. And people can disagree and they can kind of bring up concerns that they have, right? And say, like, I think this is the best option for the patient. You can really work through it. Yes. And it's not often I'd say, oh, we should do yeah. this. And a therapist says, actually, <laughs> in my experience, I think right. this is primary. Right. I say, okay, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there aren't many places in the United States that are doing this with children. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Mainly it's because... Um, Getting insurance to pay for these across state lines is very hard. Okay, and I'd say for for children, the the most that we can that we do in the U.S. are through the Shriners. Okay, um, but then again, it, it's 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 hard because there's not very mm-hmm. many centers that mm-hmm. Shriners centers that do that surgery, so it's a little difficult for kids. So if a family was out there with a with a, a child that was interested in in coming here for an evaluation, would that possibly be an option if insurance wasn't a barrier? Absolutely. You guys are seeing pediatric patients. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so which patients would really benefit from a hand surgery consultation? I would say everyone at some okay. point should be evaluated, and and the idea is even if 90% of those patients don't have surgery, mm-hmm. at least they know about the options, mm-hmm. um, and then. Uh, they're never wondering. I think right. today in today's society, mm-hmm. people are in the digital age right. want to see what the best options right. are. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, we just haven't, as hand surgeons, done a very good job of saying what's available. Mm-hmm. So I think just meeting with the hand surgeons to just say, "Yep, everything you're doing is is right." Mm-hmm. And if it fails, here are some options. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been fantastic. Do you have anything else that you want to add or share that you think is important knowledge to get out there for families and patients? No, I think just uh, being an advocate for yourself. Um, as the patient and for your family members, because um, again, a lot of physicians don't know about these different options. Mm-hmm. Um, and here, we're all of us are very quick to say, "I don't know." Let me call someone that does. Mm-hmm. I think just being aware of um, all the different organizations out there. I think for any of these patient populations, peer support is probably the best. Absolutely. Um, so just just getting out there on the internet and asking, um, "What can we do to make things better?" I think that's probably the key. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today and and sharing your personal story with us as well. This has been fantastic. If people want to get in contact with you, where would they where would they uh, call? Would they go through the Mayo Clinic um, number referral number? Yes, they can do that. Or if on the Mayo Clinic uh, website, Mm -hmm. you know, we all have our biographies. Mm -hmm. If you go through there, uh, you you can uh, take a look and see the things that we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And then there's always a little button there that says request an appointment. Perfect. And um, you know, we'll see most anyone. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone who watched and joined our conversation today. You can catch the next Ask the Mayo Mom on Facebook Live on June 7th. Dr. Colin Driscoll, who is an um, ear, nose, and throat doctor, will be joining us to talk about hearing loss in children and cochlear implants. Uh, Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day.